my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who's Mark Roberts, who really does need no uh, introduction because he's been associated with this program for about 40 years, Mark. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many lectures you've given, but they've always been entertaining uh, and a good quality. So he keeps coming back for more. Um, and so tonight he's telling us the interesting story about George Eliot, famous Victorian novelist who spent time in Florence researching her perhaps less than well-known novel, Romola. Um, but I'm certainly interested to hear more of that story. So over to Mark and I'll pop back at the end to help with the questions and answers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 19th century. On um, the 24th of March, 1860, Marian Evans and her common law husband, um, Let's see, doesn't seem to be moving on. There we are. Uh, her common law husband, George Henry Lewis, set out together for the continent. Although he belonged, he longed for fame as a scientist, Lewis is now known almost exclusively for his 24 year cohabitation with the novelist George Eliot as Marion liked to call herself. After Paris, Rome and Naples, they arrived in Florence in mid-May. She thought that unlike Rome, Florence looks inviting as one catches sight from the railway of its cupolas and towers and its embosoming hills, the greenest of hills sprinkled everywhere with white villas. She delighted in the view what a relief to the eye and the thought among the huddled roofs of a distant town to see towers and cupolas rising in abundant variety as they do at Florence. The weather was beautiful. They took a comfortable salon and a large bedroom in the Pension Suisse on the corner of Via Tornabuoni and the Via della Vigna Nuova, just opposite Palazzo Strozzi, paying 10 paoli a day, about five shillings, equivalent to 31 pounds in modern money. We are at the quietest hotel in Florence, Marion wrote, having sought it out for the sake of getting clear of the streams of English and Americans in which one finds oneself in all the main tracks of travel so that one seems at last to be in a perpetual noisy picnic obliged to be civil, though with a strong inclination to be sullen. The Swiss pension was a favorite of eminent musicians such as Donizetti, Rossini, and Verdi. Marion and George spent their morning sightseeing, carefully recording their drive out to the Cascine or the Boboli to San Miniato or Fiesole. Once they made an excursion to Siena. Of this view of the Florentine Campanile and Duomo, Marion wrote, the entire view on this side, closed in by Giotto's tower with its delicate pinkish marble, its delicate Gothic windows with twisted columns and its tall lightness carrying the eye upward in contrast with the mighty breadth of the dome is a thing not easily to be forgotten. In her journal, Marion described the view from Bellos Guardo as seen in this landscape by John Brett painted in 1863. There is Brunelleschi's mighty dome and close by it with its lovely colors not entirely absorbed by distance, Giotto's incomparable campanile, beautiful as a jewel. Further on to the right is the majestic tower of the Palazzo Vecchio, then the elegant Badia and the Bargello close by. Nearer to us, the grand campanile of Santo Spirito and that of Santa Croce. Far away on the left, the cupola of San Lorenzo and the tower of Santa Maria Novella, which actually you can't see in this picture. Um, a few days after her arrival in Florence, 
Marion made a momentous decision about her next novel, which would be her fourth. George had been reading a guidebook about Girolamo Savonarola, and he noted, it occurred to me that his life and times afford fine material for an historical romance. Polly at once caught at the idea with enthusiasm. Polly was um, George's name for Marion. It is a subject which will fall in with much of her studies and sympathies, and it will give fresh interest to our stay in Florence. This was the germ of Romola. The very next day, they made their way to the convent of San Marco, which had been Savonarola's headquarters. While Marion contemplated Fra Angelica's great fresco of the crucifixion in the first cloister, George explored the convent for her, as women were not admitted. He made notes on what he found. On the way back to the pensione, they bought copies of Savonarola's poems and of Jérôme Savonarole, Sa vie, ses prédications, ses écrits, by François Tommy Perrons. In the Maliabekian Library, at that time housed in the Uffizi, they examined a manuscript volume by Savonarola, written in a minute, short-sighted hand, but very clear. And this is in fact characteristic of Savonarola's handwriting, as we can see from his annotations to the prophet Isaiah in a printed Latin Bible, which is now in the Bibliotheca Ricardiana. In Palazzo Vecchio, they visited the Salone del Cinquecento, built in only seven months from July 1495, under the direction of Savonarola, to house the great council that was required by his extra democratic constitution. And two days later, they went to Palazzo Corsini to see the much reproduced painting of the execution of Savonarola, which they seem to have thought was by Polaiuolo. It is amazing how much art historical misinformation made its way into the pages of their journals. In this highly emblematic composition, we see Savonarola and his two companions thrice, once on the ringhiera in front of Palazzo della Signoria, being degraded from the clerical state by the papal commissioners, once walking along the gangplank, accompanied by hooded comforters, and once in their death agony, hanging in chains above the flames. Marion, or Polly, was an exceptionally observant tourist, attentive to the tiniest details. Speaking of Fra Angelica's exquisite Madonna della Stella, which she saw in the sacristy at Santa Maria Novella, she wrote, with his lovely angels and with their seraphic joy and flower garden coloring. At Orsan Michele, she noted, the great wonder of the interior is the shrine of white marble made to receive the miracle working image that first caused the, the consecration of this mundane building, originally a corn market. Surely this shrine is the most wonderful of all Orcania's productions. For the beauty of the reliefs, he deserves to be placed along with Nicola Pisano and for the exquisite Gothic design of the whole, he is the compeer of Giotto. Marion wrote in her journal, for early Florentine paintings, the most interesting collection is that of the Academia. Here we saw a Cimabue, which gave us the best idea of his superiority over the painters who went before him. It is a colossal Madonna enthroned. And on the same wall, there is a colossal Madonna by Giotto, which is not only a demonstration that he surpassed his master, but that he had a clear vision of the noble in art. Both of these gabled altarpieces are now in the Uffizi. In London, the Lewises had been on friendly terms with the prolific novelist Anthony Trollope. 
George called at the Villino Trollope in Piazza Maria Antonia, now Piazza Independenza, seen here, hoping to see Antony's brother Tom, but he was away. Tom's wife must have returned the call because George recorded in his journal, Mrs. Trollope called, bringing with her an awful visitor, a Miss Blagden who beset Polly. Miss Blagden was Isabella Blagden, Robert Browning's dearest Isa, a mysterious Anglo-Indian person who settled in Belo Guardo in 1849. She wrote not very good poems and evidently Marion found her tiresome. Tom Trollope returned to Florence and Marion and George were invited to spend the evening at the Villino on the 30th of May. Among the other guests were the young American journalist Kate Field and the Anglo-Irish novelist and raconteur Charles Lever. Lever had been very jolly and amusing in his youth, but he now felt rather stale and used up. He wrote, after, 30, after 38 or so, what has life to offer? but one universal declension. Let the crew pump as hard as they like, the leak gains every hour. Pretty Kate was not impressed by the visiting couple's physical appearance. Miss Evans or Mrs. Lewis is a woman whose whole face is of the horse bank. I like Mr. Lewis, who is a very ugly man but very charming in conversation so that you forget his looks, she wrote to her aunt. The Trollops were most welcoming. George noted, they showed us over their house and we descended into the garden where the fireflies, the first I have seen, were abundant. Perhaps they all talked about the capture of Palermo by Garibaldi's forces, which had taken place three days previously. This is an interesting photograph of the interior of the Villino Trollope at about the time of the Lewis's visit. It's a huge building with no fewer than 15 large windows overlooking the piazza. After they left Florence, Marion was relieved to receive good news in Rome about the sales of her latest novel, The Mill on the Floss. 4,600 copies had been shifted within four days of publication, which was extremely encouraging. Now it's time for a short digression on the life of Fra Girolamo Savonarola, around the last six years of which Marion was to construct her novel. He was born in Ferrara in 1452, the grandson of a famous physician. As a young man, he was realistic and having apparently been disappointed in love, he joined the Dominican order in Bologna in 1475. He told his father that he wanted to be a Knight of Christ. Seven years later, he was assigned to the convent of San Marco in Florence. For some years, he traveled about as an itinerant preacher until at the urging of Pico della Mirandola, he was recalled to Florence by Lorenzo de' Medici in 1490. Having overcome the Florentines' resistance to his harsh Ferrarese accent, he was acclaimed as a great orator and preacher. He had a large hooked nose, a long upper lip, and most beautiful and expressive hands. His prophetic sermons attracted such large congregations that he moved to the Duomo. Repent, O Florence, while there is still time. Clothe thyself in the white garments of purification. Wait no longer, for there may be no further time for repentance. Savonarola terrified people with the horrors of the divine punishments and made them weep at the tenderness of the divine mercy. It is not I who preach, but God who speaks through me, 
he correctly foretold the deaths of Lorenzo and of Pope Innocent VIII, and his vague prediction of God's scourge coming from across the Alps seemed to be fulfilled when the French king Charles VIII invaded Italy in 1494. Savonarola won the gratitude of the Florentines when he apparently persuaded the French king to withdraw from the city. Soon, however, he came into conflict with the worldly Spanish Pope, Alexander VI Borgia. Although Savonarola held no elected political office, he was the de facto dictator of the Republic, which he had set up after the expulsion of the Medici. Processions of children paraded through the streets, singing his favorite psalm, Ecce Quam Bonum, and other sacred songs. Wigs, cosmetics, playing cards, dice, and lascivious books and paintings were publicly burnt in the so-called bonfire of the vanities. When Savonarola refused to give up control of San Marco, Alexander excommunicated him for disobedience. His star began to wane. The ordeal by fire to which he had been challenged by a Franciscan rival turned out to be a damp squib as it was rained off. Public opinion turned against the friar. He was arrested by the mob and throughout Holy Week and Easter Week 1498, he was repeatedly tortured. He confessed to being a false prophet, then retracted his confession, then confessed again. Finally, he and his two faithful Dominican companions were degraded from the clerical state by the commissioners sent by Alexander, were hanged and burnt in Piazza della Signoria, and their ashes were scattered in the Arno. Now we must return to Marion Evans and George Lewis. One year later, in April 1861, Marion told her publisher Blackwood that she would soon be setting out with grave purpose for Italy, since her two week stay in Florence in 1860 had not provided her with nearly enough, enough, enough information about the city in the late 15th century. She would need a good deal more before feeling able to embark on the huge and incredibly detailed fresco of her forthcoming masterpiece. Her plan was to return to Florence and immerse herself in the history and topography of the city, hoping that in some way um, a narrative would emerge that could be attached to the tragedy of Savonarola. She and George left England on the 19th of April, the day after his 44th birthday and a few days after the outbreak of the American Civil War. This is a portrait painted some years earlier by her Swiss friend and landlord in Geneva, Francois d'Albert Durad. They visited the tomb of Eloise and Abelard in the cemetery of Père Lachaise. This was a popular destination for lovers' pilgrimages. In Avignon, Marion was especially keen to see the tomb of the feminist philosopher Harriet Taylor Mill, who had died some three years previously and had been buried by her husband, John Stuart Mill. She had been an ardent advocate of women's rights, which is enough to explain Marion's interest in her. In the south of France, Marion noted Everywhere a delicious plain covered with bright green corn, sprouting vines, mulberry trees, olives, and here and there meadows sprinkled with buttercups. When she writes corn, she doesn't mean maize. In traditional English, corn is a generic word for wheat and barley and similar crops. After Genoa, they reached Pisa, where Marion was feeling a bit under the weather, but the sight of the Campo dei Miracoli roused her a little, and after some bouillon, she was well enough to set forth and enjoy this marvellous cathedral 
Campo Santo, Baptistry, and Campanile. They took the train to Florence and by seven in the evening were installed at the Albergo della Vittoria on the river. Later, I think they moved to the Hotel de l'Europe, located inside Palazzo Spiniferroni in Piazza Santa Trinita. From one or other of these hotels, they sallied forth to study the cloister at Santa Maria Novella and went to feast our eyes on Giotto's tower and the cathedral, which of course did not yet have its hideous late 19th century facade. Dear Florence was lovelier than ever on this second view, Marion noted, and ill health was the only deduction from perfect enjoyment. Both she and George were afflicted by chills, grip, headache, sore throat, and fever. And in addition, Marion had severe period pains. Nevertheless, they enjoyed walking through the old Florentine streets. They spent five days in the Maliabekian library looking through old books and manuscripts. George noted, it is a delightful library to study in and the books are brought rapidly and without trouble. Slips for the books they consulted are reproduced in the 1907 London edition of Romola, edited by Guido Biaggi, one of the founders of the British Institute. Jackdaw-like, Marion copied into her notebooks all sorts of fragmentary information about the Florence of Savonarola's day. Costume, sumptuary laws, language, dialect, toponyms, family names, descriptions of fairs and ceremonies, of bonfires, barbers, jesters, funerals, the making and marketing of woolen cloth. Marion and George soon established a daily routine. They got up at seven, breakfasted, then George smoked a cigar. By mid-morning, they were out sightseeing in the churches and galleries and visiting the secondhand bookstalls. They enjoyed poking into the curiosities of old Florence, as George wrote to his son. Then they headed for the Maliabekian Library, where they continued their researches. At two o'clock they ate, then took a siesta until five or six. After that, they drove out or rambled about, sometimes going to the opera. We have had glorious sunsets shedding crimson and golden lights under the dark bridges across the Arno, Marion wrote in a letter. Twice after leaving the library, they crossed the river and visited a silk weaver near the Porto San Nicolò, not far from where Romola is supposed to live in Via dei Bardi. She showed them her loom and told a pitiful tale of meager income, gave her a day's earnings and departed rather sorrowful, noted George. He too made notes and drawings. On Marion's behalf, he again visited the parts of the San Marco convent where women were not allowed. From the refectory, a spiral staircase leads to the cells. A few paces from the top to the right is the other staircase, opposite which is the Annunciation. I have never seen the spiral staircase, he mentions, but it can be found on the floor plan and it is referred to in the novel. He notes that Savonarola's cell is five paces long and four broad, so presumably he paced it out for her. In a letter she wrote, Mr. Lewis, is kept in continual distraction by having to attend to my wants, going with me to the Malibekian library and poking about everywhere on my behalf. I having very little self-help about me of the pushing and inquiring kind. But no matter how pushing and inquiring she had been, they wouldn't have allowed her into San Marco, I am sure. <laughs> 
Samuel Smiles' famous book, Self-Help, had appeared just two years previously. On the 16th of May, they went to a concert to hear Giovanni um, Bottesini, known at the time as the Paganini of the double bass, and still considered the greatest virtuoso on that instrument who has ever lived. George wrote to his son about it. On the left, we see Bottasini clutching his, his special double bass, built in 1716 by Carlo Antonio Testore, which he bought in 1838 for 900 lire. It's now owned by a private collector in Japan. Although Florence was at this time home to several major English writers, such as Walter Savage Landor and Robert and Elizabeth Browning, the Lewises did not see many people during their five weeks in the city. We should always remember that they were not considered a respectable couple, being unmarried. Only progressive or bohemian types were likely to see them socially. An English painter called Jane Benham Hay, whom they had met the previous year at the Villino Trollope, came to call on them at their hotel. She had left her English husband and was living in Florence with an Italian artist, Francesco Altamura. In 1867, she had a success with her painting of the Bonfire of the Vanities. And here is another of her efforts a Florentine procession. I'm showing you two, I'm showing it to you twice because I'm not sure which one has the correct color. Here we see the brothers Tom and Anthony Trollope and below them the Villino. On the right is Tom's wife Theodosia. Tom was out of town but the Lewises saw his wife and his seven-year-old daughter Beeche on several occasions. Theodosia had begun to publish poetry in 1839, and her work was praised by Landor, though not by Mrs. Browning, who thought she lacked genius, which suggests that Mrs. Browning thought she did not lack genius. She had arrived in Florence, aged 28, in 1844, and stayed with Fanny Trollope in her house where she met and married um, Fanny's son, Thomas Adolphus, known as Tom. As usual, there were interesting people at the Villino, and both Italians and English sat about in the cool lodger, drinking lemonade and smoking. Here are some members of the Horner family, photographed in Florence in the early 1860s. They lived in Piazza Pitti. I have no idea whether they frequented the Villino or not, but they may well have done. But in any case, these are the sort of clothes that people wore at the time. One of the company was Colonel John Whitehead Peard, known as Garibaldi's English, had a fascinating head and a huge iron gray beard. He was evidently a reading man for I found his signature in the member's book of the Gabinetto Vicieux Lending Library. The Lewises were very impressed by Colonel Peard, but I am sorry to say that one of his underlings described him as a bloodthirsty man who, unable to gratify his penchant for murders in his own country, comes out here and gloats over his victims. Another friend of the Trollops, Signor Tibaldi, gave them tickets for a ceremony in memory of the Tuscan heroes of 1848, held in the Basilica of Santa Croce on the 29th of May. This was before the modern facade was put on. The church was hung with drapery and all the side altars were ablaze with lights. In the center stood a huge catafalque with a crowned angel standing before it. The aisles were lined with troops and a military band struck up the dead march, which they both found extremely moving. After the mass, an impassioned sermon was preached by a small blind priest 
Padre Angelico, whose fiery delivery was recalled by Marion when she came to describe Savonarola preaching in the Duomo. On Tom Trollope's return, he persuaded them to undertake an expedition to Camaldoli and La Verna, which they did, going part of the way by pony. They enjoyed the monasteries and George's journal is full of monastic routine. On this trip, Tom Trollope noted Marion's extraordinary powers of observation and how she drank in every detail of the Camaldolese hermit's life in their monastic retreat. Many years later, he wrote in his autobiography, when I read Romola, I was struck by the wonderful power of absorption manifested on every page of it the rapidity with which she squeezed the essence and significance of a most complex period of history and assimilated the net results of its many-sided phases was truly marvelous. Tom, by the way, was engaged on writing a four volume history of Florence and he turned out to be an excellent source of historical information about the city. Before they left Florence in early June, they called at the Villino to say goodbye. And there they heard the sad news of the death of Cavour. That was 160 years ago last Sunday. This same sad news pretty much finished off Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who perished some three weeks later at Casa Guidi. Her tomb was designed by Frederick Layton, who was to illustrate the novel. Back in London, Marion embarked on a massive reading program to fill in the gaps of her knowledge of late 15th century Florence. She read Gibbon and Hallam and Michelet for accounts of the Middle Ages and the revival of learning, Daniel Rock's Hyrurgia for details of ecclesiastical vestments, Montalembert, Mrs. Jamison, Hippolyte Elliot for the history of the religious orders. She seems, however, never to have grasped the distinction between monk and friar and repeatedly calls Savonarola a monk, whereas he was definitely a friar. She closely studied books on the history and topography of Florence, Jacopo Nardi, Benedetto Varchi, Jean-Charles Léonard de Sismondi, Filippo de Nelli, Pompeo Litta, Scipione Amirato, Giovanni Villani, and especially Marco Lastri's multi-volume L'Osservatore Fiorentino, which she indexed in her notebook. Of course, she read the early biography of Savonarola, misattributed to Pacifico Burlamacchi, and the modern one by Pasquale Villari. She studied William Roscoe's two Medici biographies and read Vasari's Lives of the Artists. Not content with histories of Italian literature, such as those of Tiraboschi and Manni, she read widely and deeply in the primary texts, Boccaccio, Petrarca, Poliziano, Machiavelli, Pulci, and many more. Her friend Joseph Langford brought her a copy of Le Moulin Illusé, and she used it for checking details of costume. Writing to her publisher Blackwood, George described Marion as buried in old quarters and vellum bound literature, which I would rather not read, but she extracts nutriment, I have no doubt. She herself combed the secondhand bookshops for rare works, and in her journal she noted, in the afternoon, walked to Molini's and brought back Savonarola's dialogue De Veritate Prophetica and the Compendium Revelationum for four pounds, exclamation mark. She puts the exclamation mark, not because she thinks she's got a bargain, but she's amazed at herself for having spent so much on two books. Um, she went to the British Museum to check on some details regarding the death of Lorenzo de' Medici. The celebration of Corpus Christi and Savonarola's Lenten sermons of 1492. On another visit to the round reading room, where she could easily have seen the down at heel Karl Marx sitting at desk G7, she 
picked up some details from Mani's life of Bartolomeo Scala, also from Borghini's Discorsi about the simplicity of Florentine table equipage. She examined prints in the print room. Having soaked herself in all these secondary and primary sources, Marion desperately hoped that some sort of a story would emerge. So far, it had not. She dwelt continually with much depression on the probability or improbability of my achieving the work I wished to do. And she kept being distracted by the thoughts of a novel with an English setting, no doubt the future Middlemarch. One day she got into a state of so much wretchedness in attempting to concentrate my thoughts on the construction of my story that I became desperate. George wrote to Blackwood, she remains immovable in the conviction that she can't write the romance because she has not knowledge enough. Now, as a matter of fact, I know that she has immensely more knowledge of the particular period than any other writer who has touched it, but her distressing diffidence paralyzes her. She had frequent headaches. George did his best to cheer her up. And every day they walked in Regent's Park, often to the zoo, where they would talk about her book. Of one of these conversations, she wrote, I struck out an idea with which he was thoroughly satisfied as a backbone for the work. And a few days later, she felt that she conceived the plot of my novel with new distinctness. Nevertheless, by late August 1861, she was utterly despondent about my book, trying to write, trying to construct and unable. Brooding, producing little dreadfully depressed about myself and my work. I am much afflicted by hopelessness and melancholy just now. So utterly dejected that in walking with G in the park, I almost resolved to give up my Italian novel. Ideas for the English novel continued to intrude. On the 8th of December, she told him my conception of the story, and he expressed great delight. Shall I ever be able to carry out my ideas? This sounds like a classic case of writer's block, a phenomenon first described by the Austrian psychoanalyst Edmund Bergler in 1947. Bergler, incidentally, blamed oral masochism, bottle feeding, and an unstable private love life for the difficulties that authors face in getting ahead with their projects. If one waits for the right time to come before writing, the right time never comes, wrote Marion's exact contemporary, James Russell Lowell, in a letter. On the 1st of January, 1862, Marion noted, I began my novel of Romola, unusual name. It's not really a Christian name at all, but the name of a small hamlet off the Via Volterrana, La Romola. For the name of the vengeful old man Baldassare, Marion seems to have been influenced by the quondam papa, Baldassare Costa, who lies in the Florentine baptistry in a magnificent tomb by Donatello and Michelozzo. The source of Valdosare's relations with his ungrateful adopted son, Tito, appears to have been an anecdote told to Marion in the winter of 1855 at Fraulein Solmars in Berlin about noble vengeance, which so impressed her that she copied it down twice. This may have been the element in the plot that George pronounced an adequate backbone for Marion's book. We know from Marion's own words that one of her principal objectives in writing the novel was to recreate late 15th century Florence as exactly as possible. To her friend R.H. Hutton, she wrote, it is the habit of my imagination to strive after as full of a, a, a vision of the medium in which a character moves 
as of the character itself. The psychological causes that prompted me to give such details of Florentine life and history as I have given are precisely the same as those which determine me in giving the details of English life in Silas Mana. This careful recreation of Florence is something that has surprised and delighted many Italian readers of Romola. According to Kate Field, in one of her gushing articles, Marion's detailed knowledge of the city was a cause of wonderment to erudite Florentines who have lived to learn from a foreigner. Years before, in the Westminster Review, George Lewis had glibly and flippantly declared that in order to write a romance, one needs only to study Walter Scott and the historical novelists to cram for the necessary information about costumes, antiquated forms of speech, and the leading political events of the epoch chosen. He may have regretted this superficial advice when he saw poor Marion doing her cramming, scrambling about in old books to discover endless trivial details. The American feminist Margaret Fuller described George as a witty, French, flippant sort of man. He reported to the publisher of Blackwood that Marion was buried in musty old antiquities, which she will have to vivify. I am a sort of Italian jackal, hunting up rare books and vellum-bound unreadabilities in all the second-hand bookstalls of London. As we have seen, Marion found the process of composition while writing Romola extremely stressful. And one of the reasons for this was that she had abandoned her old publisher, Blackwood, and had accepted a 7,000 pound offer from George Smith, so that the novel was to appear in 14 monthly installments in the Cornhill magazine. Dickens and others have written about how very stressful serial publication can be. Marion was sometimes close to missing her deadline. On the 30th of September, 1862, she noted in her journal that she was not yet at the end of the part due to be published in December. Her awareness that 7,000 pounds was far more than anyone had ever been paid for a novel did not help her peace of mind. It's well over three quarters of a million in our money. She made two famous pronouncements about the writing of this particular book. I began it a young woman, I finished it an old woman. And there is no book of mine about which I more thoroughly feel that I swear by every sentence as having been written with my best blood. This chalk drawing was made in the earlier 1860s by the Irish artist Frederick William Burton. If Blackwood was disappointed at losing his top-selling author, he determined to put a good face on it. Privately, he said that he regarded all quarrels, but especially literary ones, as extremely vulgar. Accordingly, he sent Hatter, saying that there were no hard feelings on his part and that he hoped they might be able to do business in the future. He sounds to have been a nice man. After Romola appeared in monthly installments between July 1862 and August 1863, Smith Elder and Company brought out a three-decker edition, seen here. Blackwoods later published a version in two volumes. There was also a Tauschnitz souvenir edition, specially illustrated with sepia photographs, which sold well in Italy for example, in Edward Goodban's English bookshop off the Via Tornabuoni. It is said that if Dublin were destroyed by an earthquake, the city could be perfectly reconstructed from the pages of Joyce's Ulysses. The same somewhat exaggerated claim could no doubt be made in respect of Florence and Romola, for Marion took immense trouble to get the topographical details exactly right. One critic of the 1950s wrote that, as we read Romola, 
we become increasingly familiar with the sights, the sounds and the aroma of Florence until we reach the point where we feel at home in its narrow winding streets and its broad squares and eventually fix in our minds an image of the city that is as clear as a steel engraving. A few years later, Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky would produce a similarly detailed image of St. Petersburg in his novel, Crime and Punishment. Now, let us look at Romola. The story takes place in Florence between the death of Lorenzo de' Medici in 1492 and the hanging and burning of Savonarola in 1498. A Florentine merchant meets a shipwrecked stranger, Tito Melema, a good looking Greek scholar who fascinates everyone with his honeyed voice and hyacinthine locks. Tito makes friends with several other Florentines, including Nello the barber and a pretty young girl named Tessa. He is also introduced to a blind scholar named Bardo dei Bardi and his beautiful daughter Romola. This is one of Frederick Leighton's rather mawkish illustrations in the Cornhill magazine. Leighton had been chosen as illustrator because he'd studied art here at the Accademia di Belle Arti and knew the city well. As Tito becomes settled in Florence, assisting Bardo with classical studies, he falls in love with Romola. However, Tessa falls in love with Tito and the two are married in a mock ceremony. He does this for fun, but the simple and trusting Tessa takes her so-called marriage seriously. Tito learns that his adoptive father has been forced into slavery and is begging for assistance. Comparing his filial duty to his new ambitions in Florence, Tito decides that it would be futile to attempt to rescue his adoptive father. This allows Romola and Tito to marry. They become betrothed at the end of Carnival to be married at Easter. The novel then jumps ahead to November 1494, more than 18 months after the marriage. The charismatic Dominican friar Girolamo Savonarola preaches about ridding the church and the city of corruption and drums up support for the new Republican government. Lorenzo's son, Piero de' Medici, is driven from the city. Tito, now a valued member of the of Florentine society, participates in the reception for the French invaders. He encounters an escaped prisoner, none other than his adoptive father, Baldassare. Tito denies knowledge of the prisoner and calls him a madman. Baldassare takes refuge in the Duomo, seen here, where he swears vengeance on his unfilial adopted son. Growing ever more fearful, Tito plans to leave Florence. To do this, without telling Romola, he sells off the library of her father Bardo, who had died some months earlier. This act of betrayal kills Romola's love for Tito. She secretly leaves him and Florence, but is persuaded to return by Savonarola. Again, the action of the novel leaps ahead from 1494 to 1496. France has endured political upheaval, warfare and famine. Religious fervor has swept through the city under the leadership of Savonarola, um, seen here. Um, culminating in the bonfire of the vanities. Starvation and disease run rampant through the city. Romola, now a fervent supporter of Savonarola, helps the poor and the sick whenever she can. Meanwhile, Tito evades attempts by Baldassare to kill and expose him and keeps up his secret marriage to Tessa, on whom he has fathered two children. Political turmoil erupts in Florence. Five supporters of the Medici are sentenced to death, including Romola's beloved godfather. She learns that the odious Tito has played a role in their arrest. Romola pleads with Savonarola to intervene, but he blandly refuses. Her faith in Savonarola and Florence is dented, and once again she leaves the city. Meanwhile, Florence is under papal pressure to expel Savonarola. The friar's arrest is effected by rioters who then turn their attention to members of the city's political elite. 
Tito becomes the target of the rioters, but he escapes the mob by diving off the Ponte Vecchio, seen here, into the Arno. Spoiler, when he clambers out of the river, he is murdered by Baldassare. Romola makes her way to the seaside. Emulating Gostanza from Boccaccio's Decameron, she drifts out to sea in an open boat to die. However, the boat carries her to a small village afflicted by the plague, where she brings assistance to the survivors and helps to bury the dead. Romola's experience gives her a new purpose in life, and she returns to Florence. Savonarola is tortured and burned on a gibbet, but for Romola, his influence remains inspiring. She takes care of Tessa and her two children with the help of her elder cousin. The story ends in an epilogue 11 years later with Romola imparting sage advice to Tessa's son based on her own experience and the influences in her life. Well, after that rapid summary of 700 pages, I should like to read you a short extract from the novel in order that those of you who are unfamiliar with it may judge its style and its author's powers of observation. The extract I have chosen is a description of the studio of the artist Piero di Cosimo, one of several historical characters who have walk-on parts in the novel, sometimes to unintended comic effect. Both Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo put in brief appearances in a rather corny Hollywood style, whereas Machiavelli plays a more important role. Piero led the way through the first room where a basket of eggs was deposited on the open hearth near a heap of broken eggshells. Marion would have read in Vasari's Lives of the Artists about Piero di Cosimo's fondness for eggs, which he used to boil 50 at a time. In one corner, Amidst a confused heap of carved marble fragments and rusty armor, tufts of long grass and dark feathery fennel had made their way, and a large stone vase tilted on one side seemed to be pouring out the ivy that swarmed around. All about the walls hung pen and oil sketches of fantastic sea monsters, dances of satyrs and maenads, St. Margaret's resurrection out of the devouring dragon, Madonnas with the supernal light upon them, studies of plants and grotesque heads, and on irregular rough shelves, a few books were scattered among great drooping branches of corn, bullocks' horns, pieces of dried honeycomb, stones with patches of rare colored lichen, skulls and bones, peacock's feathers, and large birds' wings. Rising from among the dirty litter of the floor were lay figures, one in the frock of a Vallambrosan monk, strangely surmounted by a helmet with barred visor, another smothered with brocades and skins hastily tossed over it. Amongst this heterogeneous still life, several speckled and white pigeons were perched or strutting. Two men and three corpulent toads were crawling in an intimate way near the door stone. To me, this description evokes one of those very elaborate pre-Raphaelite paintings with much detailed observation and an effect of hyper-realism. It's an imaginative expansion of a hint in Vasari to the effect that Messi Piero was reluctant to have his studio cleaned or tidied. And this picture is Piero's finding of Vulcan, now in Hartford, Connecticut. Despite the high hopes entertained on its behalf by the publishers, Romana did not sell nearly as well as its predecessors, and it ended up being remaindered. Ordinary readers seem to have been disappointed in it, and it was accused of instructive antiquarianism. The intelligentsia, on the other hand, press the novel to its bosom. Robert Browning, who first called on the Lewises in December 1862, told Marion that Romola was the noblest and most heroic prose poem he had ever read. 
Anthony Trollope admired the heroine's character and was sure the novel would outlive its author. Gladstone effusively praised the book at a dinner party. Henry James called it the most important of George Eliot's works. It was admired by Mazzini, Tennyson, Monkton Milnes, Bulwer Lytton, Millet, and F.D. Morris, among many others. The Westminster Review wrote, it cannot be denied that Romola is less popular than its predecessors, but we do not hesitate to say that it is its author's greatest work. The Spectator called it one of the greatest works of modern fiction. For myself, I tend to agree with the anonymous reviewer writing in the Athenaeum, as a novel, Romola cannot be called entertaining. It requires sustained attention and it is by no means light reading. But those who do not seek the mere amusement of an exciting story will find noble things in Romola. Eloquent and beautiful pages, subtle utterances and lovely thoughts. This portrait by Samuel Lawrence was made around 1860. I've nearly finished. Um, six years after its publication in book form, in March 1869, Marion and George set out for another continental holiday. They traveled down the Rhone and along the Riviera, shivering in the rain and hail brought by the Mistral. Marion wrote in a letter, in shunning the English march, we found one quite as disagreeable and without the, the mitigation of home comforts. At Florence, they stayed five days with the widowed Tom Trollope in his new house at Ricordboli, seen here, as he had sold the Villino in the Piazza Maria Antonia, now rebaptized Piazza Independenza. Marion was in bed most of the time with a sore throat and other ailments. George, in spite of his sciatica, went to a party at Isa Blagdon's, having presumably decided she was not so awful after all. On the last day, Marion was strong enough to go with George to see Professor Schiff demonstrate a machine that measured the speed of thought. The Frankfurt-born Moritz Schiff had become professor of physiology at Florence University in 1862, and his experiments on cats and dogs at the specula, though useful scientifically, attracted the wrath of the anti-vivisectionist Francis Power Cobb. This was Marion's last sight of Florence. They took the train to Naples, where it rained continuously for 10 days, and then made their way to Rome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. We need now to get rid of the, um, the share, stop share. There we are, people popping up, and I can see the chat. So um, we will proceed as usual with question and answer. The option of people unmuting and talking to us doesn't work tonight. So people on Zoom who want to intervene, please put something in the chat and I'll read it out on your behalf. We have got our, our guinea pig audience in here. Um, and so I'll invite them to speak to us in person. Um, there's, okay, there's a, a couple, of, we'll start with a couple of um, uh, comments from uh, the chat first, because there's many more people on Zoom than in the room. Um, so it happens. Um, Edward Cheney, who used to be in Florence a lot, an old friend of mine has corrected me for mispronouncing Bastoni and it should have been Batoni, Pompeo Batoni at the beginning. Thank you, Edward. Um, I was getting into a quite a big model then. Um, on the subject of the, of the lecture, um, so a question for Mark. Um, do we know anything about the model for the character of Tito, whether it was based on anybody? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. I think it was her invention. Yeah. Uh, I may be wrong, but he, it, 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 I, I think the character of Tito was her invention. Uh, he, he's the only non-Italian character in the book. The, this is remarkable that, that Romola was the first book to deal in 
exclusively with Italians, you know, the first major book by, by an English novelist. Um, he's not technically Italian, he's Greek, but he's, he's not distinguished from the Italians, I don't think. However, as a model for him, I'd, I'm not aware of one. Thanks, Mark. Um, so Michael Griffiths would like to ask a question. Why don't you come up to the microphone and do it yourself, Michael? First of all, Mark, I feel a bit responsible for this evening because I think it was my suggestion to you, could you do something on Romola that led to this fascinating talk? Um, you know that I'm a, um, a fan of George Eliot and also of, of Romola, which I think is a book that anyone who wants to know about Florence or comes to Florence is a book that one should read because uh, it's, its account of Florence and particularly, of course, of Savonarola is absolutely fundamental to the book. And in a way, it is a kind of... Um, um, biography of Savonarola. If one wants to understand Savonarola and what he stood for and how he came to an end, um, I don't want to ramble on about that, but the book that I would recommend that people read is a biography by Roberto Ridolfi of Savonarola, um, which is a fascinating account of his life, gives you a very good appreciation of what he stood for and how he came to his end and the relationship that uh, George Eliot had for him um, as a reformer um, who went a bit over the top with um, the bonfire of vanities and all that kind of thing. Just she didn't really approve that. He does talk about um, Savonarola's marble rigidity in some way uh, to reflect a bit how he went. But um, unfortunately, I've, we couldn't find a, um, a translation, an English translation of, in the library of, of, yeah, of the I'm book. I'm not sure it is translated. It's not translated. Um, anyhow, I, um, uh, it ends with um, a marvellous summary of um, Savonarola, which um, I recommend again you read. It's basically his conclusion is that had the church been able to respond in a more intelligent way to Savonarola and what he was trying to do to reform the church, maybe the Martin Luther would never have had the success that he had afterwards in, 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 reforming, in reforming the church. And um, so in, in that sense, it's, I think that's an interesting look at the way that Ridolfi does sum up very well uh, the, the character as he does in his biography of Machiavelli. Um, if you want to understand uh, Machiavelli, read his biography. And of course, that history is going to be shortly follow after um, the um, of, after Romola and uh, Savonarola's death with the Soderini Republic. Um, which um, uh, was close to the heart of 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 of, of, um, of, of, of George Eliot, and I think that, um, in one sense, uh, want to get a view of Savonarola. That book of by uh, the bi 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 biography is um, um, worth reading. And thank you very much indeed for you, uh, telling us, taking us through um, what is a remarkable, remarkable book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for that, Michael. Uh, it's interesting to me that um, uh, in popular reception, uh, Savonarola, rather like Machiavelli, has a very universally bad press, sort of being a bad type. Mm. But uh, it's interesting that the people who have actually taken the trouble to look at it more closely, including, I think, George Eliot, um, fact, tell a much more balanced version of the significance of Savonarola and his, his good points as well as his somewhat excessive points. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Um, in the chat, we've got lots of um, fan mail for you. Um, so uh, lots of people saying thank you and how interesting the talk was, which I thoroughly concur. Um, 
Oh, a question from Walter North in the chat. When was Romola translated into Italian? And what has been the Italian critical reception? Do you know the answer to that? Yeah, yes, I'm afraid I don't know much about the Italian critical reception of Romola. Pr probably um, Julia Holloway does. I, I, um, it, I think it was, it was um, translated certainly in the 19th century. I mean, um, I had as wrongly assumed that Guido Biaggi's 1909 edition was in Italian. In fact, it was published in London and was the, an English edition with, with um, Biaggi's commentary. Um, I know there's been a certain amount of scholarly attention paid to uh, the reception of Romola in Italy, but it's not a line that I personally have followed. I'm sorry. Um, Julia, I, I, I can see you, but I don't think I can hear you. Try unmuting in case we can hear you. No, we can't hear you. It doesn't work. So if you do have any brief thoughts, just write them down in the chat, chat please. Um, yes, come on, to, to, um, ask a question here to the mic. Um, a very basic question, but why was George Eliot so inspired by Sagging the Novella? Excuse me. Why, why, why was she so interested and inspired by the Dominican friar? His name I can't pronounce. He's so famous. So really, yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Well, why was she so inspired by him? Well, I, I believe the germ of, of the of her interest in Savonarola was this meet this um, remark by her common law husband George Lewis that his life and times would provide a. a you know, uh, an interesting basis for a historical romance. And I think it grew from that. And Lewis decided it would it would improve their time in Florence if they, um, you know, went to San Marco and so on and looked at the, at the um, um, Salone del Cinquecento and, and, and with their researches in the Maliobecan library. I think that was, it was really his suggestion that made her fascinated by Savonarola. Was it, was yes, well, was it anything to do with the Protestant aspect? Well, I think undoubtedly she, she was always very interested in religion and she moved from, I think, um, you, somebody may correct me here, but I think her original background was Unitarian, but she, um, she translated Strauss's Life of Jesus, and she became, um, by the time she met Lewis, she became a free thinker. But she was always extremely respectful about other people's religious opinions. And um, in, certain, in certain aspects, she admired Savonarola as a, as a prophet and a reformer. Mm -hmm. um, look, Julia has followed my instruction and posted something on the chat, which is, I don't know when Romola was translated. The search instead that of Aura Lee, but important are the engravings by Lord Leighton, who also designed EBB's doom. Yeah. The scene between Tito and Romola is marvelous. A child, as a child, she ran away with my father's Quaker great aunt, Sarah Maria. So that's lots of bits and pieces from, from Julia. In, in, an idle thought. Did uh, Marion take on the nom de plume George because she was dating George? Mm, or yeah, it, yes, that, that, that was a, a yes from a Mark <laughs> off, off screen. So that, that's why the next. So there were two Georges in this relationship, yeah. <laughs> which is interesting. Um, any more from anyone in the room? No. We, we, it was a good long lecture, so we, we were way, way over the hour, but that's not, not never a problem. But no, it wasn't too long at all. It was fascinating. Um, anything from anyone on the Zoom? No, I'm sorry we can't hear you. We'll, we'll fix that for next week. So next week, um, I don't know whether uh, Stefano um, Filipponi can actually come here or not. I asked him if he could, and he has not told me yet. Um, so, but even if he isn't, I think we, we might have him on the Zoom and have people in the room if people want to come. Um, because I think it's, it's, not, it's time to start seeing a bit of each other. Um, it remains for me to put in my weekly um, request that uh, for anyone who feels they could make a modest contribution, please do so on our Just Giving site, which Sarah will post now.
Um, we're enormously grateful for the contributions we've received over the last year, um, which have really helped us to keep going through this difficult and strange time. As I've said before, for those of you who can't be in Florence, or indeed who are not yet ready to come into an a, a enclosed space, um, we will certainly continue to Zoom the, uh, the lectures. Uh, I would think probably indefinitely, it's a, it's a good way to engage people all over the world. Um, at the same time as running them live in the room when uh, insofar as it's safe to do so, which we believe at the moment is, it is uh, Florence being back in Zona Bianca, which means you can have a meal inside a restaurant. Uh, so I reckon you can probably sit in small numbers in this large room as well, which is why we started this week. Um, so until next week, I wish you all a good night. Huge thanks to Mark for another in your long running successful Thank lectures. You. I mean, fascinating talk. Um, I'm in two minds, but I want to get a uh, risk reading wrong, although, but <laughs> I feel I probably ought to. Um, and so thanks to everybody um, and uh, good night. And we'll wave at you, even if we can't hear you. Um, I'll, show you I'll show you the room, I think. If I can get this off. Yeah. There they are. There's everybody. There they are. There lots of waving going on. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. That's Mark waving. Wave for the camera, Mark. I'm not sure that anyone can see me. <laughs> All right. Well, that's enough for me and enough for Mark and enough for everyone in the room. And thank you to everyone on the Zoom. Um, alla prossima. Alla prossima. Not all. Thank you. Thank you very much.